So it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning, and probably the reason so many people got out of bed early on a Saturday, uh, <laughs> the CEO of Vic Health, Dr. Sandra DeMayo. So Sandro is a medical doctor. It's like, you're like a new age version of Rob Moody, really, you know, because I've been around a while. <laughs> yeah, so, as a medical doctor and a globally renowned public health expert and advocate, he was previously CEO of the EAT Foundation, which is a science-based global platform for food systems transformation. Sandro has also held the role of medical officer for non-communicable diseases, uh, non-communicable non conditions and nutrition at the WHO. Sandra originally trained and worked as a medical doctor at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne. He holds a master's degree in public health, a PhD in non-communicable diseases, and has held fellowships at Harvard Medical School, the Copenhagen School of Global Health, John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and the University of Melbourne. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sandra DeMayo. No worries. Thanks very much, Lynn, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, too, would like to just start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on here in, in beautiful Geelong. Um, I'm always, uh, always feel privileged to be able to come down and visit this uh, incredible waterfront city um, and would like to acknowledge the traditional owners, the Wadawurrung people, uh, but also the traditional owners of the land that I live on and work on, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, uh, any elders past, present and emerging and any First Nations leaders in the room. Uh, and as Lynn said, um, as we find ourselves in a, uh, in a, in a defining year, uh, as we ask Australians to reflect on the past, uh, on the present and on the future rights of First Nations Australians, the longest continuous culture in the world, uh, and a group of, a, of, of peers and colleagues and friends who continue uh, to, on average, uh, experience a 20-year life expectancy gap in what is one of the richest countries in the world. Um, I, th I do think that it's important as health leaders, uh, as organisations as an, and as, as individuals to reflect uh, on this important question that we will be asking ourselves uh, and what uh, deep connections that has to the determinants, the drivers and the outcomes uh, of health. Uh, I'd also like to um, acknowledge uh, Lynn. I didn't realise this was your last uh, conference and I think uh, a round of applause for um, the incredible contribution that you've made over the years to um, the primary care <laughs> network. <laughs> Who would have thought coming in um, that at the end of your tenure you'd always, in, in addition to everything else you'd also be managing uh, and stewarding the organisation through uh, a once in a century global pandemic. Thank you to Rowena for inviting me um, and also for choosing the topic today. Um, I'm a strong believer uh, in the fact that uh, the best way really to improve health outcomes uh, is, to, is to invest strongly uh, in young people, uh, in their voice, in their future, uh, but also in their health. And that's certainly uh, a focus that we share um, at Vic Health. Doesn't seem to be changing, I'll just... Oh, there we go, that's me, great. Uh, and um, now I am gonna leave some time. I am quite passionate about what I do. I'm very lucky I get to do my hobby uh, as my full-time job. Um, and uh, I will leave some time for some questions because it's Saturday morning, the last thing you wanna be is lectured. Um, but I, I do have some slides and I just wanted to take you through, tell you a little bit about um, how we, as we as, as an organisation are working, how we're continuing to change, but also as clinicians, opportunities that we have uh, to really continue to shape prevention and health promotion in Victoria. So I don't know how much you know about Vic Health, but I'm not Ewan Wallace. Uh, I don't run the department, uh, although um, sometimes uh, Ewan loves it when people um, bowl me up and start telling me uh, about all the things that they want changed as he stands next to me. Um, but I run the state's prevention agency. So it was actually a, a really incredible piece of visionary policy, and I can say that because I was a few years old at the time, uh, in the late 1980s. And it was the state government here in Victoria uh, that, that uh, took the bold ambition uh, to ban advertising uh, of tobacco. And so overnight, uh, these were the days when you could still smoke on an aeroplane and um, uh, light up in our hospitals or outside our hospitals. 
Um, but overnight, the uh, Victorian government, in a world first, decided to ban advertising of tobacco. So uh, Marlborough, you know, was on the chests of our VFL players, the, um, the Grand Prix, the tennis, the ballet, in fact, even. Um, and so overnight, that became illegal, uh, and all of that advertising uh, space was replaced uh, with health messages from Vic Health. To fund that, though, uh, they taxed and used uh, an incremental increase in the excise here in Victoria uh, to fund health promotion. So a hypothecated tax on tobacco to fund uh, health promotion, which was a world first uh, at the time. And since then, about 30 organisations around the world uh, have copied the model, including Thai Health and Tonga, Tonga Health and agencies in Queensland, South Australia and Western Australia, all modelled on our Victorian uh, Vic Health model. Over the next decade or so, uh, the tobacco industry, as they do, challenged the tax in the High Court and won. Um, uh, they would, of course, 20 years later, uh, take us to the World, World Trade Organisation when we then did plain packaging, but that's the way they behave, and we'll talk a bit more about that as we talk about vaping later in the presentation. Um, and so the shift of the agency really moved from just buying out advertising, uh, so in the early days, you saw um, great uh, adverts on, probably on the, on the side of the freeway between Melbourne and Geelong, in fact, um, like this, uh, moved from uh, buying out advertising to really a, a more comprehensive focus on uh, promoting health and preventing disease as a state's prevention agency here in Victoria. So we know the challenge of non-communicable diseases, this group of diseases that uh, 50 years ago really were the marginal issue in global and public health. Uh, they, they, in fact, are defined by what they're not. Probably the worst way you can, uh, if any marketing person in the room's wondering how to define a group of diseases, best not to do it by what they're not. Um, but it's a reflection of the fact that 50 years ago, uh, the big challenges facing most countries, including uh, even Australia, were issues of water and sanitation, of maternal child health, uh, and of infectious diseases. And as populations aged, as healthcare systems improved, uh, as we um, saw the Green Revolution and incredible uh, leaps forward in agriculture and production uh, and food security, these issues of infectious disease became increasingly uh, dominated by a group of modifiable uh, and largely preventable diseases we call non-communicable diseases. Uh, in, in Australia, that's diabetes, heart disease, cancer, and chronic lung conditions and mental illness. And we know that about two-thirds of um, these conditions, so about a third of cancer and anything up to three-quarters of diabetes uh, is largely preventable through what we think of here as often characterised as lifestyle factors, but really what they are are modifiable risk factors. So things that we can, uh, in fact, change. Uh, we also know, though, that in Australia, uh, we face a very significant growing challenge of chronic disease. Um, and we know that, on average, uh, this, the, the average Australian, the average Victorian, lives for 11 years at the end of their life uh, with pain and suffering resulting from largely preventable disease, chronic disease. We know that one in two Australians face chronic disease, and many Australians increasingly, in fact, um, face multiple chronic conditions. In fact, we looked at the health data here in Victoria and in South Australia uh, at what percentage of the population use, uses you know, a proportion of hospital bedtimes. Uh, and we found that it's around, and this won't be a surprise to many of you, uh, it's around one in 20 uh, Australians use roughly half of hospital bedtimes. Um, and when we analysed the data further, what we found was the common uh, element among those and the significant change over the last decade here in Australia was not an ageing population, it wasn't demographic shift, uh, it wasn't really changing conditions, but it was the significant rise of multimorbidity, uh, of individuals living with complex, uh, multiple chronic conditions. And uh, if that's, you know, if, if um, uh, there's any audience that I don't need to explain that further to. It's you guys, you know that better than I do, um, but certainly uh, it brings forward again this important uh, and urgent challenge of how do, we, uh, how do we focus more on prevention. 
We also know that you know, the social determinants are alive and well in Australia, and one, one reflection of that is that our postcode continues to be one of the best uh, reflectors of our um, risk of chronic disease, and, in, and indeed, in fact, our life expectancy. You can, you can map uh, life expectancies across postcodes uh, in Melbourne, in Victoria, across Australia, uh, and very closely see uh, as you move usually out to the west uh, and also uh, out into regional Victoria, uh, life expectancies uh, get shorter uh, and they're concentrated in certain postcodes. Now, obviously, that's not related to the, the four digits of the postcode. It's related to the social determinants, uh, to the opportunities, uh, the environments, uh, and the systems in which we're born, grow, age, and ultimately uh, die. Um, but they, these huge inequalities do continue to exist across Victoria. If we look at food uh, and food access, for example, uh, we know that roughly the lowest 20% of you know 20% income neighbourhoods have uh, around two and a half times as many junk food outlets as the highest income neighbourhoods. We know that the newest developments are out to the west and the north. On average, uh, individuals in those communities now live 14 kilometres from uh, fresh food. In St Kilda, that's 400 metres. These differences make an enormous uh, impact on the lives and health uh, and ultimately the lifespans uh, of Australians. So a few years ago when we were starting to look at our new strategy, which we'll launch uh, in, in about six weeks, um, we wanted to make uh, an important shift, start to make an important shift in the way that we think about health from this risk factor dominated conversation of the last decade, the idea that you know, we do have the four modifiable risk factors and the four disease outcomes uh, outlined by the WHO uh, around the high level meeting in 2011, an important way of thinking about and characterising the interlinkages between risk factors and disease outcomes, the multiple co-benefits that we get from addressing things like uh, harmful use of alcohol uh, or um, smoking. But we wanted to start really shifting our focus more to the determinants of health. How do we look further upstream uh, at the deeper drivers and the causes behind the causes um, so that we can start you know, making uh, greater gains? So we commissioned a piece uh, or a special supplement in the Medical Journal of Australia, and I can provide that um, to you all. It's quite interesting reading. Uh, it was put together by 65 of the country's experts uh, in different health determinant areas, including uh, a chapter wholly led by First Nations uh, academics and leaders on cultural determinants of health. And it really started to, I suppose, paint the picture for us uh, very clearly that um, it was, there was this deeper, uh, more upstream uh, group of determinants that drive health, out health outcomes for Australians. So I want to talk now just quickly about some of the shifts that we're making uh, at Vic Health, some of the changes uh, in the ways that we're working. Um, and I think this might be helpful and then I'll talk quickly about an emerging challenge that I know um, is on the minds of many of you. So about th three years ago, as we were um, entering the second year of, or two years ago, as we were entering the second year of the global pandemic, um, it became very clear to us that young people were initially are hardest hit indirectly, and as the pandemic continued, uh, very hard hit directly by uh, the, the consequences of the, uh, of the pandemic, economic, but also um, social and, um, and, and medical and health-wise. And so we decided to develop uh, and invest the largest ever investment we've made um, in the health of Victorians, a $45 million three-year investment called Future Healthy, which was co-designed by young people from across Victoria but it also became a really important opportunity for us to start working with our partners and driving healthcare and uh, health outcomes in a different way. And I want to talk to you about a couple of those. So the first was, again, this, this shift away from uh, the idea of behaviour-based health promotion uh, or, um, uh, you know, I suppose, behaviour change-based only or education-based only uh, investments to... Uh, looking far more at the systems that um, drive health outcomes. We talked before about postcodes, and I always use, I think, a helpful example uh, is uh, the, plan the planning laws here in Victoria. Uh, so currently the planning laws here in Victoria think, what, what does planning have to do with health? Well, I'll give you two examples. 
I mean, you guys probably know, maybe this is an audience where everyone's like, well, obviously planning has a lot to do with health. But I'll, I'll give you two examples anyway, because I was speaking to a minister the other day and they didn't have that reaction. Uh, they looked at me confused. So the first is I was out in Tarnit not long ago, um, a wonderful community, multicultural community, um, and I was with the local member of parliament, a wonderful leader and a good friend, and um, I said to her, we were talking about gender equality and the importance of gender equality and, and the connections between gender equality and health. And I said, what's, what's the number one thing we could do to improve, to shift the dial on gender equality in your community? And she sort of thought for a moment and she said to me, build more parking, sp parking spots at the local train station. And I thought to myself, what on earth does parking spots at the local train station have to do with health? It shows that, you know, as a, as a white man with no kids, I have um, a big blind spot because she explained very clearly for me that uh, women in her community, uh, if they wanted to get a, uh, a parking spot at the train station and then get into town to make it to work, to be able to participate in the workforce, a major um, driver of, of gender equality, uh, they would need to be at the train station by 7 o'clock in the morning. If they're at the train station at 7 o'clock in the morning, though, they can't drop their kids off at school. And this is a very multicultural community where much of the caregiving for children continues to be uh, in the hands of women. And so those women in her community are faced with a decision, do they drop the kids off at school or do they get a parking spot uh, to be able to participate in the workforce? And I always say, you know, it's, there's a big difference between uh, a choice and an opportunity, a, a choice and an option. A choice is uh, something that you do uh, yourself, an option is something that you're given to. Uh, and in this case, they had no choice because there was no option. Uh, you know, they, uh, and so it became very clear for me in that circumstance that actually as a health promotion agency focused on gender equality, we can continue to run campaigns, you know, reminding women how great it is to participate in the workforce, to um, push for, uh, you know, quotas on boards or uh, to push for other opportunities for uh, women to be able to uh, enjoy uh, and achieve better health through equality. But if we're not focused on the things that actually matter to women in those communities, and in this case uh, it was the planning laws, um, we're not going to make a lot of progress. The second example came from actually uh, a conversation I had in Mansfield with the, C with the CEO of the council. Uh, and this was probably the fourth time that I'd spoken to a community across Victoria who were at VCAT spending a lot of public money, uh, a lot of private community money from the pockets of individuals in those communities, and a lot of stress uh, fighting a multinational junk food company, uh, which I won't name, but has golden arches, um, <laughs> Uh, from, from coming into their community. This was the fourth community, at least, that had spoken to me about this uh, in 12 months. There are tighter restrictions in Victoria around how close you can build a pharmacy to another pharmacy than how many junk food outlets you can build right next to each other. And there, is no, there are no provisions in the planning laws in Victoria to stop regional town or to protect regional towns who desperately don't want a McDonald's in their community from having one built. And very often what happens is that they will fight and fight until they run out of money or steam or, or both. Uh, and then uh, as a constant reminder of the lost battle, they'll have the golden arches in their community for decades to come with, with dire health consequences, uh, including, which really gets up my uh, goat, is um, the, the way that they then go and sponsor local sport uh, um, uh, through vouchers that actually cost families money uh, and most parents don't want. Anyway, that's a conversation for another day. So you can start to understand that, you know, we can run health promotion campaigns, we can give people leaflets, we can tell women, you know, do this or do that. But at the end of the day, uh, if we're not actually looking at the structural systems that sit around people, understanding what is important to them and co-designing it with communities, then we're not going to make a lot of progress. And so that's what we did with Future Healthy. It was the first time that we actually rolled out a major program driven by uh, the community themselves. We had uh, a co-design process with 15 young leaders from across Victoria. Uh, we had, uh, and we had a crowdsourcing campaign uh, that saw thousands of young people answer the question, you know, what, what do you want this money spent on? 
how can we help you and your health at this time as we look to recovery and building back healthier? And there were three areas that probably don't really surprise many of you in the room, and in fact, they still look very similar to what the evidence suggests and what the 4x4 modifiable risk factors would tell us. Uh, so food absolutely shows up, physical activity shows up, uh, and mental wellbeing show up. But how we invested and where we invested were quite different from probably what we would have done if we hadn't have taken a community-led approach. So the first was to roll out seven new youth-led uh, community-owned food hubs across Victoria. And the insight really was that while uh, food, we saw a doubling of food relief. I was sitting on the food relief task force with the minister at the time. Um, we were doing some work to make sure that, you know, new food relief guidelines to make sure that food is as healthy but also as culturally appropriate uh, as possible as more Victorians and new Victorians for the first time faced food insecurity, unable to put food on the table or refill their pantries. But what we also found increasingly were, was that young people were, being fa were facing food insecurity uh, and largely for the first time and that they weren't, there weren't really pathways into the food security, um, uh, into the food sector. Uh, there weren't opportunities to participate uh, and also for um, employment. So these seven youth-led uh, food hubs were launched in existing uh, food uh, organisations, one in, in fact not far from here um, at the Common Ground Project just outside of Geelong. Uh, and six others across the state, all in regional Victoria. The second was uh, a program, so when we asked young people again, what do they want when it comes to physical activity? It wasn't, it wasn't a campaign telling them to get active. They knew that exercise was good for them. Um, they even knew where to find, you know, local physical activity opportunities. But we still saw young people dropping out in record numbers from organised sport. And we know that you know, participation in those sorts of opportunities are not just good for their physical health, but also critical for their mental wellbeing through social connection. And so when we ask people, you know, what young people, what do you want this opportunity to look like? They said they wanted it to be flexible. They wanted it to be non-competitive. They've just spent two years going through an incredibly difficult time. The last thing they want to do is compete with their peers, be pitched against other young people in their community. They just wanted an opportunity to participate in a way that wasn't competitive. They wanted it to be local, uh, so they, you know, transport continues to be a huge issue for participation among young people in regional Victoria, as you know well. And the last was they needed it to be free because young people were facing uh, tough times uh, with the cost of living. And so we rolled out a program that looked quite different from how we'd worked previously, but still also engaged and took the sports sector on a journey. So on one hand, we rolled out a major program in 16 local government areas, 160 sites activating underutilised spaces, spaces that weren't being used by local councils uh, or weren't being used by local communities. But with RecLink as a partner, we're able to deliver non-competitive, flexible, free and local opportunities to participate and connect for young people. On the other hand, we also then worked through our regional sporting assemblies, of again, which we have a fabulous one here in Geelong, uh, to really try and upskill and take the sports sector on the journey of, well, maybe the classic 45-minute uh, or hour-and-a-half competitive um, uh, match each week at a certain time uh, wasn't working for young people, and could we look at more flexible, non-competitive, uh, shorter and free ways for them to participate? And the last was really a, a co-designed co investment um, of using art with nine arts organisations across Victoria uh, to really think about what the, you know, I suppose, refocus young people's uh, imaginations um, on the future through, um, uh, through art. Uh, and then uh, we la just launched it last week in Mildura uh, and there'll be a number of activations um, and exhibitions over the coming summer. Uh, young artists engaging with young people, talking uh, about agency uh, and opportunities we look to the future. So I'm going to show you a very quick photo of one of our, a video of one of our um, community champions who uh, was uh, one of the individuals who helped us to shape this three-year investment. Her name's Zara. In high school, we had a dingy old art room that was a safe space for me. Having that sense of homeliness that allowed me to feel safe and build such 
meaningful social connections with others. In my community, the youth are feeling isolated. It's hard for us to find activities where we can feel engaged in. And I'm not connected to the people around me as much as I would like to. Change works when a lot of people are working together. If the community understands what we're going through, only then they will be able to build programs that attract the young people to engage in the community. Let's have a pop together. <laughs> Together and share our cultures and our together. Thank you, Zara. The other big shift that we've been focused on is really, I suppose, being a better partner to the organisations that we work with. Um, and this again came out of some really critical insights as we travelled and listened to community leaders across Victoria. So I remember very early, uh, I've been in the role now almost four years, or three and a half, four years. Um, and I remember very early uh, in my time at Vic Health, I was in Mildura, um, and the local council up there, sort of, I walked, you know those meetings when you walk in and everyone's a bit awkward, and you're sort of like, what's going on here? Something interesting's about to happen. Uh, there's something they're not telling me. Uh, and it's usually because there's a power dynamic, that they're, you know, we're a funder, they're worried to say what's really on their mind, uh, but they desperately wanted to, clearly. Um, so. After a few minutes, I said, look, clearly there's something you want to tell me. Just be honest. Like, it's okay. Uh, I love feedback. Um, so they said, look, we're not that impressed with Vic Health. Uh, we haven't seen you for years. In fact, there was a community nearby that we've been working with for two decades, and we haven't seen them for 19 years. They reminded me of that. Um, we feel as though Vic Health thinks that Victoria ends at Bendigo. That was the exact quote. Uh, that you change your priorities every year just as we settle in, uh, that regional councils feel left behind and ignored, um, and that while you fund uh, so many of the partners we work with, we end up with contracts with all of them, uh, and the operational cost, the transactional cost to a small regional council is enormous. So we took that on board. It was, I mean, it's incredibly helpful feedback. Um, I reflected on the, on the drive home, um, the long drive home, which is a, a, one of my favourite drives, actually, as it turns out. Um, and, uh, and it was witchy proof, actually, that I hadn't been to. We hadn't been to for 19 years, and I've been back twice. It's such an amazing little place. Um, so I was driving, as I was driving back, I was reflecting on it and got back to Vic Health, and I got my executive together, and we said, OK, we need to... There's an opportunity to redesign the way we work with local councils. Um, clearly they're telling us the way that we're doing it at the moment is not working. And more broadly across our partnerships, are we adding the most value that we possibly can uh, as an agency? We're an agency with diverse lived experience in our team. We're an agency with technical experience. Uh, but I think the biggest strength of Vic Health as an agency, and it always has been since Rob Moody, who you heard his name mentioned earlier, one of uh, my predecessors as CEO, um, very much in the DNA of the organisation is the ability to connect great work happening across the state. We're not actually the heroes of the health promotion story, and we know that. Uh, very often, our job is just to see great leadership and innovation and help to either enable it, break down the barriers to achieving what these individuals are wanting to achieve, or connect them with other people across the state trying to do the same thing. And so we redesigned the way we work with local governments and launched the Vic Health Local Government Partnership. Um, we started with 13 councils, and those councils were low CIFA. They needed to be in the bottom half of CIFA-indexed councils in Victoria. They needed to be regional councils. It was a five-year commitment, uh, and we brought all of our partnerships under one roof and strived towards a single contract with that council uh, as one of our KPIs. So you can see um, you know, how uh, the feedback uh, is reflected. And then 12 months later, I went back to Mildura and we asked them, you know, how are we going? Uh, where are the opportunities to continue to improve? Those 13 councils, the next year became 26 councils. Uh, and as of about a month and a half ago, we now cover, we're now working in active partnership with half the councils across the state. Huge demand. Now, we don't actually give those councils very much money. So everyone sort of thinks, oh, OK, well, the reason we got them to the table is, uh, is because we're offering them some, you know, FTE or a, or, a, or a big budget. And in actual fact, that program 
uh, costs us less as an agency to, do, to work closely with 36 councils than it used to cost us working with a much smaller number of councils, but in a less coordinated way. Um, and what we, what we do with those councils, though, is to give them a much more of a wraparound experience. So we help them, first of all, it's locally designed and led, so it's, the program's called something different in every community, but we do require that the focus of that council partnership uh, is around the health and wellbeing of young people. Um, we, we require the CEO to be committed, so there's high level authorising environment and approval uh, for the staff that are wanting to go on the journey uh, with us. Uh, and then we use complex systems mapping to really understand deeply what uh, the systems that are shaping um, health in those communities look like. So we sit down with local leaders uh, and we say, let's map out the determinants of health. Let's understand what the health challenges are in your community. Uh, and then let's look at the causes of those, the causes of those and the causes of those. And then start to look in the com complex web that begins to develop. Uh, of health and health outcomes in that specific community. Where are the opportunities to intervene and where can we, we be most valuable? We do provide uh, evidence-based modules, so we take the, the best global evidence that we have, including the WHO Best Buys, and we translate them to a local council context. There are some modules that are compulsory, uh, including uh, cultural safety, um, systems-based ways of working and co-design principles with young people. So there are, there's a methodological basis um, that we know is consistent across the ways of working with young people in Victoria. Uh, but there's a high level of flexibility as well that allows councillors, as council leaders, to adapt and change. And so this is really the way we're trying now increasingly to work with all of our partners, moving from inputs to outcomes, really thinking far less about uh, you know, financial partnerships alone, but value add where we can uh, connect them in through communities of practice to each other, where we can provide uh, technical support uh, and best practice evidence, uh, where we can support them through creating an authorising environment with their leaders uh, and even with the state's leaders, uh, including through changes in the planning laws that came out of those conversations that we now have as some of our policy priorities. And so a big focus for us has been moving away, and I think this is an opportunity for government more broadly, to really move away from a focus on funding being, being uh, the sole uh, convening uh, opportunity. And in fact, this week I had the privilege of, of spending two days last week at the uh, Aboriginal uh, Health Forum with Vacho, with Jill and the team. Um, and this is very much the way that the Aboriginal controlled uh, health organisations have worked and the ACHO ACHO um, uh, philosophy has worked for many years, but for us uh, in government, all too often the conversation comes back to dollars instead of outcomes. Uh, and then thinking creatively about how we can support our organisations beyond uh, financial investments. And so two examples of that that we've, um, that we've looked at are through our grants program. So, we knew what outcome we wanted to achieve. We were seeing in the, uh, in the epidemiology and the statistics that were emerging during the pandemic, as I said to you, young people, and particularly young women, um, were dropping out of organised community activities in record numbers. We had spent a decade investing in creating uh, safer spaces for women and girls to participate in sport. We run a mass media campaign every year called This Girl Can. We've been working with government to make sure that if women and girls are deciding to participate in sport, that there is cultural safety uh, and, and psychological safety skills uh, in the sporting organisations and environments, in the volunteers. And we've also been working with the councils and local government to make sure that if women and girls are wanting to participate, they're not the last on the, on the, onto the field, they're the first, and that there are change rooms for girls to get changed in, that they're not expected to get changed in the car park uh, or in the men's change rooms, which uh, you know, continues to be a challenge for many small regional communities. So we've done all of this work over a decade and we're seeing it really wiped out very quickly, unwound by the pandemic. And so we wanted to invest in um, a campaign that would uh, really, first of all, um, drive participation 
among young people and particularly women and girls, uh, but also that would support the sector, the sports, arts, cultural and youth sectors uh, over the latter parts of the pandemic. And so rather than being very prescriptive in what we wanted these sectors to do, uh, we went out with an outcome of, uh, of creating a meaningful social connection, which was a definition um, that actually uh, researchers here in Victoria uh, are leading the world in, in, in the thinking around, but the understanding, the insight that if you look at mental health prevention, all of the outcomes of the Royal Commission, really largely the evidence suggests there are two powerful ways uh, to prevent mental illness, illness. A lot of it we can't, understandably, and there is a lot of work to do in strengthening the mental health system. But the two areas in primary prevention that emerged in the evidence synthesis that we um, commissioned were addressing race-based discrimination and all forms of discrimination uh, as a health promotion and public health investment and driving and, and improving meaningful social connection, particularly for young people. And as I said, there is a definition to that. And so we, um, we launched the Big Connect, which was uh, the ambition to create 100,000 social connection opportunities for young people in regional Victoria uh, over 18 months. We had 27 partners come forward with ideas that they felt they could expand, iterate or innovate, uh, and we funded those. Um, uh, and in the process of protecting uh, the community, the organisations and sectors that we've um, spent a lot of, a, you know, a long history of partnering with, uh, we also delivered uh, over, in fact, 100,000 participation, free participation opportunities for young people across Victoria. So despite all of this um, and some great progress and some important feedback, um, there is an emerging challenge that, you know, I think a lot of you in the room are probably seeing, whether you're parents or um, uncles or grandparents uh, or indeed as clinicians. And we've talked about non-communicable diseases, um, but what happens when the companies that cause, uh, you know, where, what happens when companies start to cause uh, significant challenges uh, for health? Um, and and how, do we how do we address this uh, as a public health uh, community? So you would have seen um, over the last few months uh, a lot of public discussion uh, and most recently we've been working with the federal government uh, announce, uh, to announce these important uh, world for first reforms in e-cigarettes. So e-cigarettes have been around for, e-cigarettes or vapes, the same thing, um, have been around for about a decade. Um, they're an electronic device that basically vaporises uh, a gel or a liquid um, and delivers it in a, in a, um, uh, a cloud uh, into, deep into your lungs. Um, they were invented by a range of different sectors and entrepreneurs, but with heavy support and involvement from the tobacco industry. Um, and, and we know that they contain about 200, more than 200 chemicals, including chemicals found uh, in paint thinner, in nail polish remover, chemicals that we know are associated with cancer, uh, with damage to the brain, um, and uh, we know... Um, uh, and we know that in increasingly that they do have serious health consequences. The long-term effects are not known uh, because they haven't been around that long, but I always remind people that, you know, it took us 50... Well, it's been 70 years since the, director, since the Surgeon General's report on tobacco uh, and linking it to lung cancer. There are, small, there are more smokers on the planet today than there were 10 years ago, despite enormous progress in Australia. Uh, most of those are now in uh, low- and middle-income countries where the tobacco industry has very successfully uh, uh, set its sights as countries like Australia become better regulated. Um, and we know that these... Um, and, and that it's, it's been 70 years and it took 30 years, really, from the peak of smoking to the peak of lung cancer. And for most of that time, the industry were saying that there's no evidence that these uh, cause problems, uh, they were handing them out uh, in uh, single cigarettes uh, and, in fact, um, they were even uh, telling us that they had a role, uh, an important role, um, uh, in medicine and healthcare. It all sounds very familiar. 
So now we find ourselves in a situation where, you know, these companies, e-cigarette companies in other countries, uh, have, very have very carefully and successfully divided the public health community, and particularly the tobacco community. Uh, so a community that, after the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, the world's first health treaty uh, about 20 years ago, um, and a very galvanised and, 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 um, uh, and focused uh, community in public health. They've very successfully split that community in many countries, thankfully not here in Australia. Uh, they've launched a product that um, once again uh, is being touted as having um, an important health role, although um, the evidence is slim, it, there, there is a role, and we'll talk about that in a moment. Um, and they've very successfully used the last few years uh, in many countries around the world in parallel uh, to really, you know, um, uh, increase to create out of largely nowhere uh, in a very short amount of time uh, a very large number of um, uh, users, including 300,000 uh, users of e-cigarettes at least uh, across Victoria. We know that the single largest user group of e-cigarettes in Australia are 18 to 24 year olds. Most of them have never smoked in their life and we know that they're three times more likely to go on to smoke cigarettes if they smoke e-cigarettes. We also know, because I was in a community just a few weeks ago, that this has now become the number one issue, the number one social issue and behavioural issue for uh, schools and for principals across Victoria. We know that there are schools that are locking their bathrooms between uh, lunch, breakfast and, you know, uh, between, uh, during school time because this issue has become so pervasive. Uh, schools are installing vape detectors in their bathrooms. Um, and we know, in fact, there was a school that I visited not long ago in regional Victoria that has changed their school uniform because this is so significant a problem. So kids... Uh, can buy. One of the ways that the, community, that the industry has got young people uh, addicted is through not only the colours and flavours like Fruit Loops and Milk or Strawberry Kisses. Uh, again, very, very reflective of the early days of tobacco. Uh, they come in packets that look like makeup, uh, bright pink. Again, very alluring to young women in particular. Very, very uh, closely resembling the behaviour of tobacco in the early days and continuing today in many countries with less regulation. Uh, but they also come looking like highlighter pens. You can buy e-cigarettes that look like a highlighter pen, that look like a hoodie toggle, so you can actually attach it to your clothes and it looks exactly like a hoodie toggle, or like uh, a makeup pen. Uh, now, I had a 65-year-old truckie call in to uh, Talkback Radio when I was talking about this a few weeks ago. Uh, and absolutely, there is a role uh, for these products to be used as a last line tobacco cessation support uh, through, uh, so, you know, through proper advice from a medical professional and in particular a GP. But you can't tell me that there are many 65 year old truckies called Bob driving around with a hoodie on, uh, needing a highlighter. <laughs> And, and wanting to use makeup. If, I, if Bob is using makeup, I have nothing against that, but, but you know, clearly uh, that's, not, that's not their audience. So it's become quite a complex issue um, and a very divisive issue because, quite frankly, I mean, you know, this is big business, this is massive business, this is the resurgence of the tobacco industry, and there are countries around the world, uh, including Switzerland, where the home of Philip Morris International, one of the largest tobacco, industry, tobacco companies, uh, where they now have vaping stores that look largely like Nes Nespresso stores, a premium product uh, that, um, uh, and retail outlet, once again, for the tobacco industry that people find acceptable. Uh, PMI also, in Switzerland, sends starter kits. So if you're 18 to 24 and you want to host a party in Switzerland, uh, Philip Morris will pay for your party if you can guarantee that at least 50% of the people uh, coming to the party are not currently using vapes and if you agree to give them all a starter kit as a gift uh, at the end of the party. Again, sounds very much like the behaviour of 
the tobacco industry 50 years ago. Li literally, history uh, is repeating itself. So as I said, e-cigarettes are really targeting young people. And there are two, two important groups that we need to differentiate. So absolutely, the group of people who have been smoking for 30, 35 years, tried everything else, uh, and feel that they can have help from an e-cigarette, we want to make that as easy as possible for them to be able to access an e-cigarette. The evidence is not particularly strong uh, that e-cigarettes are an effective way of quitting smoking. We know because we, we fund the quit program here in Victoria. We know that 95% of Victorians will quit with no extra help. Most Victorians quit with no help, but we know that it takes on average seven to eight times to quit smoking. So if these products can somehow fast track that, then that could be a good thing. We also know that most people who, who quit smoking and move on to e-cigarettes, because they are such a potent form of uh, nicotine, almost all of them are still using e-cigarettes a year later. So it's not that they actually get off nicotine, it's just, that, it's just that they get off smoking. And I think that's really important as well. So for this group of individuals who have been smoking for many decades, tried everything else, uh, and are using a product that if used exactly as intended, will kill two in three of their long-term users, cigarettes, then e-cigarettes are you know, an alternative with advice from a qualified medical practitioner uh, uh, and using that opportunity to also probably do you know, screening and a heart check and a whole bunch of other things uh, at the same time. We also know, based on evidence here in Australia, that um, making it so what, what the government has done, if you're not aware, what Butler, Mark Butler, the Federal Health Minister, announced a few weeks ago is a world first in uh, trying to walk the fine line here in Australia to make e-cigarettes available for people wanting to quit smoking in a safe way whilst not having an entirely new generation of young people addicted once again to nicotine and a resurgence of an industry that is hell-bent on... Uh, you know, killing people uh, or making profit at any price. And so what they've announced is uh, basically that the product will be, so importation will be restricted. One of the big issues we have at the moment is that they are flooding across uh, the border. Uh, that the product itself will be packaged in pharmaceutical only packaging with a warning label. It will be available with a prescription via your pharmacist. Uh, it will be regulated in terms of the concentration. So at the moment, you can buy one of these uh, hoodie toggle looking e-cigarettes uh, from, illegally, from a, uh, a vaping store, cost you about $30, and it has about as much nicotine as 150 cigarettes. And it will deliver it uh, instantly into your lung. And I was speaking to a colleague last night who, who was addicted and has since given up. And the, the incredible potency of uh, nicotine in these products and the efficiency of the delivery uh, is part of why they are so addictive. Uh, and so limiting the concentration of nicotine, uh, in addition to eliminating flavours and colours, eliminating packaging, making it available with a prescription through a pharmacist after a conversation with your GP, uh, who knows best if this is the right path for you, uh, is the model that Australia uh, has, has at the moment in, in, and is further um, committing to. It is a world first, so there are a number of countries around the world that have simply banned the products completely. We are, in, in essence, banning them, uh, banning the recreational use, um, but wanting to, I think the government's wanting to, I'm not the government, so I'm just saying what I know from government uh, is that they're wanting to walk that fine, fine line uh, between uh, the two groups making it available for people who are wanting to quit smoking uh, with, uh, with support from their GP. Now, people will say, uh, isn't this nanny state and aren't you banning... Two-minute warning. Aren't you banning uh, e-cigarettes? To which I would say, we're not, you know, we don't ban antibiotics. We don't ban the oral contraceptive pill. But we also don't just allow anyone to buy it at their local milk bar uh, under the counter uh, with no oversight from a doctor. So they are still available, uh, but they're simply, it's simply not a free-for-all. 
uh, because the single largest user group of these products, 30% of teenagers in New South Wales are currently using the, are currently uh, using these products, and that number is likely a massive underrepresentation. We know that 80% of teenagers say that they're really easy to find, uh, and and they have become the number one behavioural issue uh, in schools. So we've sort of covered this. The, probably the only part I haven't touched on is that there is also an enormous equity dimension to this. So um, culturally diverse communities. So I had a young guy yesterday, Khalid, who's a community leader uh, in the west of, of Melbourne, um, hugely concerned about young people from his community, uh, from the African diaspora, uh, and the very, very high rates of e-cigarette use. We are seeing uh, a strong equity lens uh, and, in first, in, and, and indeed First Nations uh, overrepresented. So I think I'll stop there and I'm happy to take some questions. Um, thank you for having me. I'm sorry to end on such a serious note. Um, but, you know, I think the opportunity, it, it is important for us to um, understand, I did have just one quickly. I mean, I always try and give some, take, some practical takeaways. Um, you know, I think the fir first of all, fabulous to come together. Thank you to Lynn uh, and the team. Um, the last few years have been incredibly difficult. You have been at the front line uh, and there is a high level of burnout in the sector. Uh, and I think acknowledging that and coming to forums like today where we can support and connect each other uh, is so important. I think we do need to understand, I would, I would encourage you all to engage in the conversation around e-cigarettes. Uh, it's a lively conversation. It's a vicious conversation at times. There is a lot of money uh, to be made uh, if uh, Australia, if Australia were to deregulate this product, which is what the tobacco industry wants, uh, we would end up with another 70 years of putting the genie back in the bottle. It's already going to be difficult because we are a few years behind time, but I think it is really important to understand the nuances of the debate uh, and participate and also um, advise. We, are, we do have a parents hub, uh, a major social marketing, so a quit style television campaign that I'll be launching on Monday morning with the Minister, the first anti-vaping campaign that we've ever created uh, in Victoria with QUIT and the Cancer Council. Um, so there is education coming, there are resources that we're developing uh, with the RACGP, uh, there are resources for parents and there are resources um, also for teachers. But in the meantime, you know, clinicians, primary care in particular, are going to be a place where people go I encourage you to check the QUIT resource hub for adolescents uh, and parents, and also the Royal Children's Hospital have some fabulous resources, as always, that you can use. Uh, and if you have questions, if you have stories, um, you know, we, we simply don't know. The, the evidence is still very unclear. We don't know how young people are quitting. We don't know what challenges they're facing as they're looking to quit. Uh, and we are continuing to evolve the QUIT program uh, and brand, which was largely built for a tobacco era and a different generation, for what is now uh, an enormous number of young people across Victoria addicted once again to nicotine. So, you know, being across this issue, uh, reflecting it in your uh, practice, but also using uh, your trusted voice, there are there are not few there are few people in society trusted more than than, than doctors, clinicians, and primary care, um, and I think using that voice. Uh, as a force for good uh, in what is a very difficult debate, uh, but an important one for the health of the nation um, couldn't be more critical. We do have a hub at uh, Spencer Street. My team asked me to mention, so we have a co-working space in Spencer Street, West Melbourne. It's free for all of our partners. We have more than 110 organisations registered who just use it as a drop-in working space in the city. We're in the free tram zone. Uh, there, is, uh, there are spaces where you can run workshops, meetings, or just pop in for the day uh, and do some work. So um, it's hub.vichealth.vic.gov.au. If you want to register and head in, you can register um, as the network, and then any of you can uh, come in and enjoy uh, the space for free, and we look forward to seeing you in there. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. One is question, any, sorry. Oh, and also, is, yes, has anyone got... Oh, Tim, you're the first. Um, <laughs> just just uh, observing what's going on in the US with cannabis. Oh, sorry. Well, just wait for the... Um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry. We've got online attendees.
Yes, so it's important they can hear the question. Just um, looking at what's uh, happening state by state in the US as cannabis is legalised, um, what lessons can Australia take out of the fact that the tobacco industry seems to be very keen to be involved in that? Yeah, look, I mean, we, we've tried to separate the conversation around cannabis with um, e-cigarettes, but there is obviously overlap. Um, I mean, the, many of the practices... What, so we did publish in The Lancet, we supported a series that was published about four weeks ago on what we call the commercial determinants of health. I would probably encourage you to read it. It included an editorial by the Director General of WHO uh, and um, three papers in the series. And really what we try, the reason that we commissioned that series was to begin to understand the common practices uh, that industries use, um, sometimes for good but sometimes not, uh, to influence policy debates uh, and in some, in some cases democracy. Um, so there are definitely uh, common lessons, whether we look at gambling, uh, food, uh, tobacco, alcohol, even here in Australia, and I can give you countless examples um, of that here in Australia that are alive and well. So I, I can share that, it's, but if you look up commercial determinants of health, Lancet, it's about um, uh, six weeks since we released that, that um, three-part series. Frank? Oh, my, oh, no, we've got yeah. Anita oh. in the back there. Um, good morning, Sandra. Thanks for that um, talk. Uh, apart from being a GP, I've got um, significant roles in the medical school and at the hospital. So I deal with a lot of young people who are quite privileged and have played competitive sport. Um, what uh, role do you think that Vic Health would have in reaching the future workforce? Because a lot of this makes so much sense to me and I think that we underutilise our medical students and our medical schools are not really fit for the future work that they're doing. Um, is there anything that Vic Health is thinking about in terms of placements, scholarships, whatever, the new national frameworks coming out that's um, hoping to have community placements for junior doctors? It's yeah. a tricky question, sorry. No, no, thank you. So I'm um, very happy to, to receive your ideas via email. Um, I am speaking, as it turns out, on Monday night at Monash Uni uh, to the medical students, and I do love doing that, and uh, two other things coming up with medical students. But, um, and we are also not just medical students, but thinking about even non-medical uh, leaders. One of the things that we're ro we've rolled out in the last 12 months is new non-medical fellowship <coughs> training pathway uh, here in Victoria. We have, obviously, the College of Public Health uh, Medicine, uh, but for non-medical background, uh, we're rolling out a, a new two-year fellowship through the local public health units. And there are nine of those fellows in a pilot program at the moment supported by the department. Um, so I do think it's a good point. How do we start to build the capability of the next generation of leaders to really think in this systems way? But also, uh, I think, I, I always think, you know, if you, um, it was Verco who said, uh, the doctor is the attorney of the poor. Uh, it, you know, it really is our role to be engaged in and championing these issues around health equity um, and doing that with but not for communities. And so I think the more that we can do to engage um, emerging health leaders in that conversation, I'd, I would love any ideas. You, you can, I'm sure you'll be able to find me. <laughs> Feel free to um, send me an email. Great question. I'm, I'm going to have to stop. No more questions because yep. we've run out of time. We'll really give uh, Sandra a hand. It's great. Thank you. Thank you.